It'll be fine. We've got a bodyguard, don't forget. Mine. <sighs> right? Ghosts aren't my thing. <sighs> You're just being modest. After you. Mind letting me go then? Really going all in on this ghost thing, aren't they? <gasps> what was that? Look, over there. Found you. Hey. Can we talk? Just for a bit? I do remember there being ghost-like enemies and, well, they had ghosts and then ghost-ish kind of things in the train graveyard in the original game, but they're really going all in on it in this um, remake, aren't they? <laughs> Don't! That thing's dangerous. I know, but even so... What the? Saved us. <sighs> Gonna need to find another way through. No turning back. The very idea of ghosts in the Final Fantasy VII world seems a little bit screwy because aren't people and creatures and trees and whatever when they die supposed to return to the life stream and that's essentially how like there really isn't any kind of like heaven or hell or anything like that but there is kind of this eternal existence with your spirit energy returning to the life stream and that's essentially what happens every time you die or whenever anything dies so how does anything become a ghost if intrinsically that's where everybody ends up? I mean, that's just how life works in this place. You live, then you die, then you return to the life stream. There's nobody that gets stuck hanging behind. I don't know of any kind of mechanism that would make this happen. This will be stopping at the Sector 7 shrine and is bound for the train graveyard. <laughs> All right, they're just trying to turn this into a straight up horror game now. All right, well, I mean, there have to be different phases and different themes explored throughout these kinds of games, and we're just sort of going through the horror themed section. That's not funny, though. Guess the crane's up there. I gotta put a lot of effort into keeping these episodes from getting overly long. I don't like episodes that go longer than 20 minutes, although I'll do it, you know. This one will be longer than 20 minutes. But this game really stretches that. Because we essentially were going through four different dungeons between 
now and or when we reach this area and when we reach the next plot point. So we have landing in the sewers, working our way through the sewers, then getting out of the sewers, going through the outside and getting into this area, and then working through the dungeon on the next section. Now it's really all one big dungeon with different themed areas. It's not working. There's no power coming through. I wonder if this is another prank. Someone might be messing with the power supply to make us run around. Since the different sort of sub-dungeons have a different feel to them, like the sewer level doesn't feel like the train graveyard area, it has different enemies, a different art design, different musical score, the characters react differently to the environment and all that, that was probably the justification that developers had for making it so long. Now the reality is, even though they've chained together three or four different dungeons, it's kind of all the same in the sense that it's all a long gameplay session that you have to get through. Now for me, having to sort of edit that down into a series of videos that isn't overly long becomes, well, a, a little bit irritating. <laughs> Because here we are in the third episode, working what is essentially through one dungeon. It can drag out a little far. And it also has some other, well, undesirable side effects when it comes to the pacing of the story. And I've probably mentioned this a number of times in this uh, playthrough, but there is a certain pace of a story that you have to maintain in order to keep from either boring your audience or tiring them out, which will end up boring them. You want to maintain a certain level of energy or whatever as you're moving through the story, and that is going to be balanced by your gameplay sessions, meaning your dungeons and battles and all that, and the story sections of the game where you're mostly going to be in towns or you're going to be in areas which are just emphasize the story more than gameplay. Now, there's going to be some crossover between what is one and what is the other, but for the most part, one is going to end up happening or the other. It's like right now, we're in a fight. We're running through a dungeon. But there's a couple of spots in here when the characters are talking to each other or whatever. But for the most part, between the point when we left Wall Market and the point in which we will arrive in Sector 7 is one long dungeon and it is mostly a gameplay session. The guy's immune to attack. Since it's all a long gameplay session, it runs the risk of sort of tiring the player out. And it becomes a little bit too much. Also, from the perspective of storytelling, it becomes another problem because, well, we found out about the plan to drop the plate on Sector 7 when we were in Don Corneo's mansion. That was a few episodes ago. Now the next episode passes, okay, they land in the sewer and have to fight a boss. All right, then they move on and they run through the sewers. All right, well, okay, that dungeon is fairly long, but okay, you get to the other side of it. Then we're in the train graveyard. Oh, geez, how long is this going to take? You know you're on the clock, right? I mean, the Turks aren't going to wait for you to arrive to drop the Sector 7 plate. Well, that's not really true, because they actually are going to wait for you to arrive, because it's a fucking video game. Just because it's a video game, things are going to wait for you, because this is the pacing of the game. And it feels wrong, and it feels unnatural that the Turks flew a helicopter past you when you climbed out of the sewer. So they're there already. And how long is this battle going to last that our characters are screwing around here? Really, none of these people should be taking a moment to stop and talk to each other or anything. They should be sprinting through this area. It doesn't make any sense to me that we're screwing around here. Now, I know they're, the doors are locked and they're barred through and all that, but just this entire, all of the interactions here feel unnatural, and it feels like they spend way too much time here. Especially at this point in the game, and in it, it, there's an even more egregious example of this later we'll get to when I reach that episode. But it paces itself poorly in a lot of these places. I mean, overall, the story is good, but I i mean, it's a nitpick. I'm nitpicking. Do you think there's 
More in here? Mm, looks like. Aha! Found you! She seems to be rather pleased at having found the ghost that's immediately attacking them, but... <laughs> Okay, so we're seeing a pattern. Now, I'd mentioned this in previous episodes, that there were, they were going through a kind of a pattern of having all the characters sort of do each other favors. Now, Aerith in the original game was much more of... Well, she was kind of portrayed as a more innocent character than the rest of the ones. She's one that has never really done anything bad. And in a lot of ways, her character resolves out to sort of being a kind of damsel in distress kind of character trope. Now, despite there being a lot of blowback against that kind of character in modern storytelling and video game and all of that, it is actually a valid character type. You do need certain characters to sort of be the victims of circumstance or victims of antagonists or whatever. Now, it doesn't always have to be a, a female character despite the or damsel being in the in the character in the trope name but they're typically like it trying to work a plot out it makes sense that some character is being more the victim of a circumstance than others what they're doing here though is they're kind of screwing around with that a little bit so they have the different characters all portraying certain kinds of weaknesses here and there now Tifa is supposed to be the physical superior of Aerith. She's got the, she's got her fists of fury, and she can beat the hell out of things. So, like in that fight in Corneo's mansion, Tifa just punch and kicks everyone. Aerith goes and hits people with chairs. Not really a gameplay thing, but just the way it works out in stories. Now here we're having it sort of turn around. Now. Aerith is the one with, her, I guess, her connection to the planet and all that is the one that has a greater understanding of the ghosts, and she's not really afraid of them, even though they're overtly hostile, or most of them are anyway. And Tifa is terrified. Tifa is afraid of ghosts. Cloud seems... They're trying to just make him be kind of a non-element in this whole uh, trifecta here. He's sort of staying out of it. He's not afraid of the ghost, but he's not gung-ho about it either. But what they're supposed to be happening here, you're supposed to be focusing on Tifa and Aerith. Aerith is not afraid. Tifa is. Now, of course, there's a chance for character development here of Tifa overcoming that fear. But, I mean, they're doing what they can. I'm pretty sure I saw a door on the other side of this place. I think our only choice may be to find another route. I guess if they didn't add that little, those little character bits to this dungeon, it would just be a long dungeon where your characters moved from one end to the other and it would be a little bit more boring. They want to add a little bit of character to these dungeons. They're not just places where you fight and move from A to B. Unfortunately, I think they kind of do the character of Tifa a little bit of a disservice here. Tifa is supposed to be tough. She's not supposed to be someone who's afraid of things. In fact, I don't really remember too many instances in the original game where Tifa really shows any kind of fear. I mean, shit, she picks up Sephiroth's sword and then tries to stab him with it. I mean, whatever. Fortunately, something that they're doing in this game that I feel is a flaw of sort of earlier RPG or JRPG style storytelling was, was to avoid the sort of I'm going to make up a term on the spot here and call it a plot island. The idea behind this... Okay, it's a stupid term, but I'm going to use it anyway. The idea, my idea behind a plot island is that you have a character who gets introduced. And the bulk of the game, they really have nothing to do. They just sort of exist there. They're one of your people in your battle party and all that kind of thing. But they're not really doing anything. But then there comes their time to shine, and that character will step into the forefront. Now, let's say the original Final Fantasy VII, um, Red XIII's uh, plot island was when he arrived at Cosmo Canyon. Now, all the other characters are there. Cloud is there, Tifa, Barrett, Aerith, they're all there. 
But the character that gets the focus of the story at this point in the game is Red 13. Same thing happens to Barrett when you get to um, to Corel and Gold Saucer and the desert prison. He reaches his plot island, and that's where the bulk of his character development, all that kind of stuff, takes place. You understand the character, you learn a few things, the story moves forward on them. I'm not seeing any plot islands so far in this game. I mean, I guess Aerith can't really have one, because she is central to the early part of the game. Cloud isn't going to have one, of course, because he's the main character. Tifa... I don't really know how to describe her progression through the original game, because she takes part in other people's stories. She takes part in Cloud's story. She... Shit. I guess I can see a few advantages to the con concept of a sort of a plot island style story where you can allow a side character to sort of take center stage. Now, in this sort of circumstance, even though this dungeon's um, character interactions are really about Tifa and Aerith, it's not really, like, big. So it's not like a section where they walk in here and this entire section of the story is about Aerith and every aspect of this is about her and how it affects her and all that kind of thing. It's a, really just sort of a minor plot point stuck jammed in here to give you something to look at while you're going through this dungeon. If this were more of a plot island, it would be all of the character or most of the character arc would be played through during the dungeon or town or second group of dungeons or whatever you play as when you're play through when you're going through that section. So, I mean, it gives the side characters time to shine and time to take center stage. And I feel like in this more like evolved style storytelling, you're not really going to see that kind of thing happen anymore because they're going to want to modern developers and writers and all that kind of stuff for these games are going to want to write more for the other characters to do when a certain character maybe deserves to take center stage for that period of time. Not that I'm saying that any of these characters deserve the center stage during this dungeon or anything, but like when we eventually get to Coral or, or Cosmo Canyon or uh, Nibelheim or wherever, is... Barrett or Red 13 or anybody really going to take the center stage in the story? Or are they going to try to just sort of mix it up a little bit? I don't know. It, it's not even in this game, though, so we have a little while to wait to find out that answer. I guess it's a bit of a minor spoil, but I'm going to say it anyway. I'm a little irritated at the fact that not only that this dungeon is as long as it is, but this thing we're fighting here is not the boss of the dungeon, really. We have more to do. We have more ghosts to fight. That was fun. 
All this time, you were waiting for someone to come and play with you. Huh. What are you talking about? <sighs> come on, let's get back to the crane. Tifa. They're really gonna drop the plate. They won't if Barrett and the others have anything to say about it. All we can do now is keep moving. Hmm.